People Scientist, the podcast dedicated to helping us optimize our health with the latest scientific findings on nutrition, health, and medicine. I, your host, Dr. Stephanie Caligiuri, will be here with you every single week, bringing us information to ignite our thinking to help us be one step closer to the healthiest we can be. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the People Scientist podcast. If you are tuning in for the first time, then welcome to the People Scientist Army, where every week I arm us with some scientific evidence so that we can lead the healthy lives we want to live. On today's episode, I am doing part two of the alkaline water episode. Last week, I discussed the potential antioxidant capacity of hydrogen-enriched water that is often called electrochemically ionized alkaline water. But today I wanted to cover alkaline water that is simply just alkaline, that is not enriched with hydrogen. So rather it is a mineral water with a basic pH, and this in itself may have some health effects. This alkaline water is more available throughout the world, particularly in North America, as opposed to the hydrogen enriched water I spoke of last week. So let's start off with some core takeaways. Alkaline means a basic pH, or a pH greater than 7. This is the opposite to something that is acidic. An example of something that is alkaline is baking soda, which is sodium bicarbonate. To make alkaline water, many producers add minerals such as magnesium and potassium salts. But some may also add sodium bicarbonate or baking soda. The concept of an alkaline diet, or drinking alkaline water, has been around for many years. A higher protein diet or a typical North American diet tends to increase acid in the blood, which some scientists see as a negative effect. Therefore, the purpose of the alkaline diet or alkaline water is to buffer this excess acid. Now, many claims are made about adding alkaline items to the diet, but are any true? Well, some of the claims may be true, such as preserving bone mineral density and perhaps reducing the workload on the lungs and kidney in patients with compromised lung and kidney function. Lithium may also be added to water, and there is weak evidence to support that low, naturally occurring levels of lithium may have a beneficial effect on mood. But other claims such as reducing cancer risk are not supported. Now, let's jump into the details. Where I got much of my information about the health effects of alkaline water is from research on the alkaline diet. The concept of eating an alkaline diet has been around for a handful of years. An alkaline diet means consuming foods or drinks that result in the production of compounds in the body that raise the pH of our blood or urine. An alkaline diet is essentially a more plant-based diet, as vegetables, fruits, and many beans and seeds are considered to have an alkaline effect by increasing the pH of our blood and urine. Now, I was a little bit surprised that fruits, which typically contain citric acid and ascorbic acid, are considered to have an alkaline effect on our blood as opposed to an acidic effect. But many fruits contain potassium citrate, which is considered to be alkaline in our body. Whenever citrate is in the form of a potassium salt, virtually all of that citrate is absorbed and it's actually oxidized in the liver to formed by carbonate, which would lead to raising the pH. This is the case for citrate, for example, in orange and grapefruits that are complex mainly by potassium. But in opposite, if citrate is ingested as citric acid, such as in lemons and limes, then there tends to be no effect on the acid-base status. Now, some fruits that overall can slightly increase the pH of our blood include apples, bananas, and raisins. The most alkaline vegetables are actually the cruciferous vegetables, such as broccoli, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts, as well as green leafy vegetables. In contrast, the majority of foods that produce acid in our body are animal-derived, such as meats, eggs, and cheese. Another contributor to acidity in our blood is phosphoric acid from soda. So a more animal protein-based diet is seen as an acidic diet as it tends to lower the pH of our blood and urine. So why is it an issue if we eat a lot of acid-producing foods? Well, in order to describe this, 
we first need to discuss how our body deals with acid in the blood. It does this in three ways. Our body will either excrete the acid in our urine, our lungs will exhale out acid in the form of carbon dioxide, and minerals from our bones will be released in order to buffer the acid. Now, calcium in the form of phosphates and carbonates in our bones represents a large reservoir of base in our body. And in response to an acid load, such as to a high protein diet, these salts are released into the circulation to bring about a neutral pH. So these compensatory mechanisms could have some consequences depending on the individual and the amount of acid and over what period of time. For example, individuals that are living with osteoporosis or reduced bone mineral density may benefit from eating a diet that has more alkaline minerals and a diet that is not high in protein so that they can avoid a high influx of acid in their blood. This would be protective against losing some minerals from their bones. In addition, individuals that have compromised kidney or lung function may also have difficulty removing the excess acid from their blood in the form of carbon dioxide from their breath or from a reduced ability to lower or remove the acid uh, via the urine. For example, there is evidence that a plant-based diet, which should be more alkaline than a typical North American diet, is beneficial in patients with chronic kidney disease. This was published by Gluba Broska in 2017. There's also a large amount of data that supports individuals with chronic kidney disease that a high protein diet can be detrimental, and thus a lower protein diet should be followed in patients with chronic kidney disease or with end-stage renal disease. It could be in part due to the high protein diet producing a lot of acid in the blood and the kidney cannot clear that effectively. Passy in 2017 discussed the amount of acid from food primarily comes from the breakdown of animal proteins in our diet. The author postulates that reducing the acid load through a low protein diet with a greater use of vegetable proteins and increased fruit and vegetable intake would slow the progression or occasionally improve kidney function while maintaining the nutritional status of the individual. But for patients with kidney failure, that are on dialysis, they do have very specific requirements for their diet, including limiting potassium, which can be found in fruits and vegetables. So please do make sure to always take the advice of your physician and dietitian if you are on dialysis. A low carbohydrate, high protein diet with its increased acid load can result in many changes to urinary chemistry. For example, magnesium levels in the urine, citrate and pH are decreased. Urinary calcium, uric acid, and phosphate are increased. All of these result in an increased risk for kidney stones as well, which we know are increased with a very high protein diet. It has been estimated that the quantity of calcium lost in the urine with the modern North American diet over time could be as high as almost 480 grams over 20 years, or almost half the skeletal mass of calcium. So with the typical North American diet, we could lose half the amount of calcium of our bones. That's a lot. In truth, I think acidosis or too much acid in the blood really is a concern if people are eating extreme diets or drinking a ton of soda every day. Like, for example, it is a big trend right now for people to follow a carnivore diet. Yes, I said it, a carnivore diet where literally the only thing they are eating is meat and drinking water, and that is it. And I mean, in this scenario, there will be a large flux of acid in the bloodstream from the animal proteins being broken down. And consideration of buffering some of this acid with some alkaline foods or alkaline water, I think is something important to consider if someone is following a very high protein diet, such as the carnivore diet, which I do not recommend. This made me think about the ketogenic diet then, particularly the very strict and classic version of the diet, where about 90% of calories come from fat, and individuals will eat less than 20 grams of carbohydrates a day. I mean, typically, if people are following a ketogenic diet, they follow an easier version of the diet where they eat around 50 grams of carbs and about 15 to 20% of calories coming from protein. But in 2006, in the New England Journal of Medicine, a case report was published about a middle-aged healthy woman that was following a very strict ketogenic diet where she ate 0 to 20 grams of carbs per day 
and reportedly had ketoacidosis or too much acid in her blood. She had various bouts of vomiting and overall feeling unwell. When she resumed eating carbohydrates, she did return back to normal. The physician stated that she may have been at risk for ketoacidosis more so than others, and the fact that she was following such a strict ketogenic diet put her at risk for too much acid in her blood. Bergquist in 2008 reported that children following the ketogenic diet that was prescribed to them because of their untreatable epilepsy unfortunately had poor bone mineral content. Perhaps it was due to nutrient deficiency or it could have been due to more ketones in the blood. The cause was never reported. But it is important to note that these are rare or more extreme scenarios as typically fasting or a ketogenic diet does not put someone in a ketoacidotic state. It puts them in just a ketosis state as the rate of ketone body synthesis would match the rate of ketone body use by the brain, muscle, kidney, and other peripheral tissues. Plus, a small degree of the ketones would be lost into the urine. This is why in episode four, where I talk about the ketogenic diet, I state it is very important to eat plenty of vegetables, as vegetables will supply alkaline minerals to the body to buffer the acidity from ketones produced. In truth, if people are eating a balanced diet that is not too high in protein and contains a good amount of vegetables, for example, at least three cups of vegetables per day, then in truth, acidosis is not really of concern in healthy individuals. There's also some research, for example, by Klieger in 2001 that supports that an acidic environment also reduces muscle growth and may increase muscle breakdown. Dawson Hughes in 2008 concluded that a higher intake of foods rich in potassium, such as fruits and vegetables, can favor the preservation of muscle mass in older men and older women. Because excess acid in our blood, say for example from a high protein diet, could lead to minerals being leached from our bones, some studies illustrate that acidosis or a low pH of our blood can reduce bone mineral content and increase the risk of osteoporosis. For example, Selmeyer in 2001 noted that women who ate more animal protein versus plant protein had lower bone density and a greater risk of fractures. But it is important to note that there are conflicting studies. For example, in elderly individuals aged aged 65 plus, the requirement for protein to maintain bone and muscle mass increases. So in 2009, Hannon reported that in elderly individuals, those eating the lowest amount of protein had the greatest bone loss. Now, I think this study could have been confounded by many factors, but it is important to note that protein requirements do decrease in the elderly, but putting a focus on plant proteins seems to have a, a better health effect and less acid is produced in the blood from plant proteins versus animal proteins. So plant protein would be, for example, beans, peas, tofu, and tempeh as an example. Alexi in 2005 noted that high animal protein intake was only associated with low bone mineral density in children if the amount of alkaline minerals in their diet, such as magnesium and potassium, were also low. So if you're eating a balanced diet rich in potassium and magnesium, then your body will have the ability to buffer the acid produced by the protein intake. Now, sources of magnesium or potassium to help buffer acidity include beans, nuts, seeds, green leafy vegetables, potatoes, avocados, broccoli, bananas, and squash, for example. So then the question begs, so can an alkaline diet or alkaline water benefit bone mineral density? A randomized controlled clinical trial was conducted in 30 young women in order to test the effects of alkaline water on urinary markers of bone health. The women were provided one of two mineral waters. Both were rich in calcium, but one was also rich in bicarbonate, which made it an alkaline water. The women were instructed to drink 1.5 liters of the water every day for four weeks. The alkaline water reduced urine levels of parathyroid hormone and C telopeptides. And both of these indicate a reduced rate of bone resorption or less bone breakdown, which is a good thing. And three other studies since then have shown similar findings. So it appears that it is very possible that alkaline foods or alkaline water 
can help preserve bone mineral density and bone health. Are there any other health effects to alkaline water or alkaline producing foods? Well, because alkaline water can buffer acid, perhaps it can help with acid reflux. Kaufman in 2012 reported that alkaline water may help inhibit the stomach enzyme pepsin and therefore may have potential in reducing acid reflux. Typically, a quick treatment for acid reflux is to take an antacid, which contains alkalinizing minerals. So in theory, alkaline water may work effectively as well. In 2016, Fenton and Huang reviewed the scientific literature to determine if there was any support for claims being made. Alkaline water could reduce cancer or help with cancer treatment. They concluded there is almost no actual research to either support or disprove these ideas. This systematic review of the literature revealed a lack of evidence for or against diet acid load and or alkaline water for the initiation or treatment of cancer. Promotion of an alkaline water to the public for cancer prevention or treatment is therefore not justified. Are there any concerns with alkaline water? Well, yes, you don't want to have too much alkalinity or base in your body as it could prevent proper digestion, impaired absorption of nutrients, and more severely could lead to confusion, tremors, and a coma. Having too high of a blood pH is called alkalosis. Typically, this is accompanied by very low potassium as well. People that need to be wary of drinking alkaline water include those on dialysis, those who take a lot of antacids for heartburn, individuals that suffer from bulimia, or those taking diuretics as they are at a higher risk for alkalosis. There is no risk in healthy individuals for alkalosis from eating a diet rich in fruits and vegetables. The risk is more so carried with those consuming a lot of alkaline water that has sodium bicarbonate added to it. But some of these clinical trials have shown that drinking up to one and a half liters per day did not seem to have any serious side effects. But no one has really conducted a thorough safety study to see what is the maximum level of alkaline water to consume daily because it depends on what minerals are in the water, is sodium bicarbonate added to the water, what is your diet like, how are your lungs and kidney functioning, the status of your bone health, etc. So if you want to start drinking alkaline water and you are healthy with no other conditions, it appears that less than one and a half liters per day appears to be safe according to a few clinical trials. But if you are living with any conditions, it is suggested to speak to your physician or dietitian first. Or a safer alternative is to eat more alkaline foods. And you know I'm always pushing all of you to eat more veggies. So there you go, there's another reason. Now I would be remiss if I did not mention water that is a source of natural lithium. As water that contains lithium salts also tend to have an alkaline or basic pH. Now some companies bottle and sell naturally containing lithium water. There are many observational studies that show in parts of the world where lithium salts are naturally present in their source of water, that rates of suicide are drastically lower. This is not surprising as back in 1949, lithium was the first prescription drug specifically developed to treat bipolar disorder, also called or used to be called before manic depression. Now lithium is known to reduce episodes of mania and reduce suicide rates in individuals living with bipolar or manic depression. The ability of lithium to treat unipolar depression or your more typical depression is less characterized. Now, the mechanism by which lithium has these beneficial effects on mood is not very well established, but there are many mechanisms postulated, such as lithium affecting many neurotransmitters such as norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, and GABA and second messenger systems, including cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP, WINT, and inhibiting excitotoxicity during periods of mania. Lithium may also increase gray matter volume of the brain and be neuroprotective. But the amount of lithium naturally occurring in water is around 70 to 170 micrograms per liter, whereas the typical dose of prescribed lithium is 300 milligrams of lithium carbonate. So, the amount in lithium water is about 1,000 times lower than the prescribed amount. But then this begs the question, at such a low dose of lithium, can it have a beneficial effect on mood? Well, Schauser in 1993 investigated just that. They recruited a total of 24 subjects in which there were 16 males and 8 females. 
and they randomly divided these participants into two groups. Group A received 400 micrograms of lithium in tablets composed of a naturally lithium-rich brewer's yeast for four weeks, and Group B was given the same thing, but it was lithium-free. All the subjects of the study were former drug users, mostly heroin or crystal meth, and some of the subjects were violent offenders or had a history of domestic violence. The subjects completed weekly self-administered mood test questionnaires. After four weeks in the lithium group, the total mood test scores increased steadily and significantly during the period of supplementation, whereas no significant changes were noted in the placebo group. So in this small clinical trial, they did indeed see that even low dose lithium was able to improve many measures of mood. Okay, so there you have it. That is the scientific evidence on alkaline water and the alkaline diet. Alkaline water simply means that it has a pH greater than 7. Alkaline water can contain some alkalinizing minerals such as potassium and magnesium, which are essential nutrients required for our health. Alkaline water may also contain sodium bicarbonate, and it may also contain lithium salts. There is not a lot of clinical data on alkaline water to either support or disprove the health claims being made. But I do have to say that the strongest clinical data is in support of alkaline water supplying alkalinizing minerals in order to protect the bones and counteract the acidity that may be present in our diet, from example, for from example, animal protein or sodas. In my opinion, I think getting your source of alkaline minerals from fruits, vegetables, seeds, and nuts is a safer and more healthful alternative. But if some individuals are allergic to these foods or they're choosing to follow a very strict diet, such as a carnivore diet, then perhaps they could ask their physician about drinking alkaline water to help buffer the acidity. And lastly, there is a small amount of clinical data that does indeed support the low dose lithium can beneficially improve mood. So that is a wrap on this week's episode of the People Scientist Podcast. Let me know what you think of today's episode by messaging me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, or by leaving a review on Apple Podcast. Next week, we will have another Listener Request Podcast episode, so make sure to tune in for that one. And I will meet you back here next week, the same time and the same place, on the People Scientist Podcast. I hope you all have a super healthy week. Bye for now. I am a scientist simply sharing scientific evidence. Some of the clinical interventions I discuss are not appropriate for everyone. Before making any changes to your diet or lifestyle, please do consult the advice of your physician or dietitian. My opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of Mount Sinai Hospital and its affiliates.